Welcome to Business Talk here on Business Tech, and uh, it's time to take to the skies. As I've been uh, reading Crash and Burn, the CEO's uh, crazy adventures in the airline industry, full of some incredible nuggets of insight into the cutthroat uh, business of flying people around the, the country and the region, and many nuggets that can be applied to most other businesses in truth revealed by Glenn Orsmond, twice CEO of Come and founder of One Time, a riveting new book called Crash and Burn. Glenn? Welcome. As you write in the book, it's not meant to be an autobiographical account or anything like that, but you really just wanted to put on the record what really happened at uh, Com Air. Firstly, how has the book been received so far? Um, I've had a few reviews that, that have been uh, favorable. Um, I've taken a hammering on some social media, which I would have expected, but um, so far on, on all the reviews have been favorable, yes. Why do you say it would have been expected? What sort of hammering have you taken on social media? <laughs> um, look, it uh, really is, uh, uh, you know, as an industry, it's uh, a really tough industry. The margins are tight. It's a cutthroat business. Um, if you want to be liked, you're not going to do well. And um, I've been in the industry for 25, 30 years. So um, I would expect um, some of some of the reception, uh, you know, to be uh, fairly tough, which I'm fine with. I'm fine with it. Yeah, I mean, that's really, you know, who you are. You've you've got a very thick skin. You're not in business to be popular, as you said. Certainly, uh, not amongst the pilots, uh, which seem to have become too powerful in in Kome, which we'll come to. Have any of your former colleagues reached out to you following the launch of the book, maybe just to share their views and experiences of what took place, and if they have. Maybe you could just share some of the more interesting ones with us. No, it has been favorable uh, from from most of my colleagues. In fact, uh, a few were surprised um, at the actual book in terms of you know what really goes on um, in the business because um, when you're running a business, you always need to project certain positions and certain views and so forth. So um, I think some were surprised at the frankness of the book. Um, and I always say, well, I write like I talk, so it's just straightforward. Um, here's what happened. Here's my experiences. Here's the people I dealt with. Um, like I said earlier, here's the good guys. Here's the bad guys. Hopefully, I'm one of the good guys, in, at least in my view. And, um, you know, on social media and pilots, that's an age-old thing between management and pilots. Management want pilots to work harder. Uh, pilots always believe it would be a great airline if only it wasn't for management so it's not unique to me it's not unique to the airline it's not unique to the country um, it's an age-old rivalry between pilots and management and what kind of um, uh, running did you have with the pilots at com air because you do emphasize uh, in the book that w when you arrived um, uh, because you were there several times over the course of your career when you arrived a second time round. It did seem like the 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 pilots had uh, gained quite a lot of power in terms of the prestige of the kind of planes they wanted to fly that may have not necessarily been in the commercial best interests of the business. No, that's exactly right. So what what had happened at Comi, the pilot, um, the pilots became more powerful. They really decided their working conditions. Um, if I look at productivity, probably the pilots at Comi were flying on every sixty hours a month. Safis were probably flying 85 hours a month, uh, just to show the productivity difference. At the same time, the Comair pilots were earning 30, 40% more than the Safir pilots. So it needed action. We needed to bring the headcount down and we needed to push the productivity up. Um, and obviously that creates resentment. It creates uh, you know, um, a climate that's, that's really difficult when you're trying to force the efficiencies to make the business viable. Um, yeah. And what had happened over time, obviously, it had just grown really powerful a comment pilot body. And um, they were probably the drivers in the fateful decision to buy the Max aircraft. Oh, that 8 billion really, rand Max aircraft deal. Yeah, yeah. So what you happens is you're earning rands and you decide to take US dollar debt, 8 billion. Um, you're not even generating sufficient profits to pay the interest on the deal. Uh, but it's wonderful for the pilots. They are flying the newest and latest technology in the world. Um, so it was a vanity project. There was no true economic justification for that deal. And ultimately, um, it, it was more a symptom of the problems at Kame, where it lost control of costs, it took excessive debt, uh, and it stopped protecting cash, you know, which were the three fundamentals that built Kame. 
always have low costs, always protect cash and avoid excessive debts. So that max deal uh, on its own was a symptom of all three, where they'd raided the cash, they took all the cash and gave it out as deposits. They pushed up their costs because these aircraft were unaffordable. Um, and then they took on all the excessive debt in, or, you know, the, um, in order to purchase the aircraft. So it, it was a vanity project driven, I'd, I'd say, from uh, a strong pounded body in the airline. And um, what generally happens is the justification is always um, fuel savings. We need new aircraft to save fuel. But the fuel savings were really tiny relative to the added financial burden of bringing these aircraft in. And in fact, those aircraft are designed where the fuel burn is really only achieved. And it is a significant fuel saving when you fly sectors longer than two hours. But the average sector length at Combi was one and a half hours. So they weren't really achieving any fuel benefits, but just adding on this extra cost. And there was no way of winning the pilots over with just, you know, the facts on the table. Uh, did How did that relationship uh, pan out ultimately? Yeah, it, it actually was tough. Um, it was tough in the beginning. Um, we succeeded to a degree. We managed to get the headcount down and we managed to push the productivity up. So we were successful with that, with the pilots, because really they had no choice at the time. So we brought their headcount down, we pushed the productivity up, um, but we achieved all that in my third stint. I'm talking about the second stint. The second stint, uh, we achieved absolutely nothing. And that's the waste of 10 months when Comi had the joint CEOs. And for a 10-month period, the CEOs were fighting each other rather than focusing on fixing the business. Um, you know, for example, things like, uh, you know, I'm talking about the pilots, about it improving productivity, bringing down costs and so forth. Yeah, and, and in uh, hindsight, that is something that you lament, that wasted 10 months and the battle with R Renault as well. Looking at Boeing, I was reading in The Economist recently uh, just how far the manufacturer has fallen, obviously with all the issues around the, the 737 Maxes and doors falling off and you know whistleblowers being shot and all that kind of thing. It's it's really being painted as a, a, um, a corporate... Uh, you know, ethics case gone wrong if you look at it, and and the brand is suffering uh, massive damage. Uh, and looking through your own story, Boeing wasn't cooperative in cancelling the remaining orders of the seven three seven Maxes. What do you think of Boeing's stance and and the subsequent um, uh, the way things panned out and Boeing's complicity in all of this at the end of the day? Yeah, they in fact pleaded guilty to fraud in the states. You know, they've uh, pleaded guilty to fraud when uh, they've they been taken on by the victims of the two aircraft crashes, and also by the federal aviation uh, in America have taken them on, and they pleaded guilty to fraud on both. Um, I think it was a sales-driven organisation. You had to make the sale, close the sale, um, and they made the sales of the aircraft, and they closed the sales, whether or not those aircraft were affordable, whether or not they'd made full disclosure about the problems on the aircraft. Um, you know, still remains to be seen, but they have pleaded guilty. And when it came to Combe, they would not budge at all. You know, in terms of our rescue plan, we tried to talk to Boeing and say, look, guys, these aircraft aren't affordable because of COVID, because of everything that happened at Business Rescue. But um, it was really sales driven. Uh, we were dealing with the sales guys, and the sales guys were not going to forfeit their commissions. Absolutely no way. <laughs> you know, um, that they'd made on the deal. Uh, incentives, incentives drive behavior uh, so often when you want to see what's going wrong with uh, with something. And you mentioned in the book as well, you know, what happens often at a shareholder level spills over into board squabbles and then ultimately that can sink a business as well. What do you think are the big lessons that can be learned from your time there that are applicable in other businesses about ensuring that you know, shareholder squabbles don't turn into board squabbles and ultimately lead to um, a, a business that that collapses at the end of the day. Yeah, look, I, you know, I saw that at, um, at, at three airlines at one time, at Sunny and Sula, as well as Kame, if there's not shareholder unity, uh, inevitably there will not be board unity because the shareholder groups will, um, you know, translate their... Um, shield a disunity into board disunity. And once you have board disunity, it obviously filters through to the executive team. And it's a recipe for failure. There is absolutely no way a business can survive where the shareholders and the board aren't united because you start spending all your time on the squabbles of the shareholders or the board members rather than focusing on the strategy and growing the business. 
and often as well when you're going through a turnaround um and and I think here of of Nampak and the the time you spend chatting to lenders and and chatting to every everyone else uh, through a turnaround takes a, a lot of your attention away from some of the operational challenges which makes turnarounds very difficult to to achieve and why Warren Buffett often says turnarounds never turn I want to talk about your termination and the subsequent legal battle with Comme which involved significant personal and professional stakes for you. And I remember, and you write about it in the book, you were accused by Bruce Whitfield of orchestrating your own departure from Kame. But clearly on your version in the book, this couldn't have been possible. Can you just share why? I have no idea where that came from. You know, it's, it's a great story, but obviously there uh, aren't any facts to support the story. But, but it's a great story that um, somehow I you know, engineered that I'd be retrenched, I engineered um, that there'd be a first, second, third COVID wave, that there'd be a rescue plan, and lo and behold, my rescue plan would be accepted, and lo and behold, I'd return as CEO a year later, uh, and it was all part of a master plan. If only I was that smart. Um, No, you know, there was no plan like that. Um, Being retrenched is not easy. It's the first time it happened in my career. Um, and I was retrenched after my second stint to comment for stuff. It takes it out of you emotionally. And uh, for anyone to self-inflict that is really just, no idea where Bruce got the story. And I've had many Bruce interviews over the years. And I was really surprised at that one. Because I find generally, look, your stories are always great. Most of the time they're supported by the facts. But uh, that particular story, I've no idea where it came from. Yeah, and uh, again... Uh, if one looks at it, uh, clearly unsupported by uh, the timeline of events and, and also the facts on the, on the ground as well. Yeah. In your yeah. book, you do describe um, some executive inertia, and, and you mentioned that executive decision making had ground to a halt due to a project management team. You know, what is your view on how airlines ultimately should be run well and efficiently? to ensure that they stick to those prescripts of not becoming overgeared, of managing their cash flow, as you say, uh, and ensuring that um, their load factors and efficiencies are, are properly managed. Because there does seem to be a tendency to delegate to consultants, to delegate to outside um, uh, individuals who come into a business and earn a fee. And ultimately, no decision is ever made. And often we find a lot of this in government as well. We tend to lechotle things to death and we don't ever execute. Yeah, it, you know, it's something I've had strong views on. Um, I don't think I've ever appointed consultants. There, there's, um, you know, your executive team should have the skills that are required to perform the job. Um, and these breakaways and team builds, I've also never been a big fan of those either. Um, so what what had happened at Kame? So I had my first stint at Kame when I was FD, and then when I returned as um, CEO, probably seven, eight years, no, pro- probably 10 years later, the company had changed dramatically. Um, so a few things I noticed, and, and the one was obviously lost control of costs, um, excessive debt, and uh, wiped out the uh, store of cash. But probably the worst problem was the absolute inertia that had set in with a management team. So you had a powerful company, two powerful brands, Kalul and BA brands, Yet those brands weren't growing. They were just being eroded in the market every day in terms of market share. Safi was taking the market share. Air Link was taking the market share. The regional African airlines were taking the market share. So instead of growing into be a premium Southern African airline, in fact, they, they, they were shrinking the business. Um, I don't think they'd increased any capacity for several years um, once Safi had started um, so it's really inertia, and part of the inertia is uh, they set up a project team where if you had any project, it had to go into this project team, which was really like some sort of bottomless, um, some sort of bottomless pit where something goes in and never emerges. So obviously the project team solu- solution is to hire more project managers. So in the end, you have this huge project management team that just keeps asking for more and more resources that. Um, now I have accountability for projects rather than your line execs. So it's quite easy if you're a line exec. I've handed it to the project team. It's now their accountability. So I, it's, it's part of what led to that inertia in the company. 
Um, they weren't being innovative. The technology, they were lagging all their competitors. And it was all just this general inertia that had set in on the basis of we are a great airline. We've been around for 70 years. We know what we do. Please don't tell us what to do. We will continue doing what we've always done in the past. So that inertia was probably backed by some sort of arrogance, some sort of laziness, and the organization really just became fat and lazy. Yeah, and IT as well. I mean, if you look at what airlines have become and the way they integrate with um, aggregators, uh, the, the book highlights significant issues with Comair's IT systems and operational processes. Can you just elaborate on the specific challenges and the steps that you took to modernize these systems? We had all these legacy systems, and they were great systems 20, 30 years ago, but the world has just changed so much, and really Comair hadn't kept up with that. Uh, we'd fallen behind our competitors. We weren't agile. Um, even simple things like a, a phone app. We actually didn't have a phone app for Kalula. You know, I'll just use that as an example. We couldn't do online checking at the airport. You know, the airport had, had those kiosks where you could arrive at the airport and, and do check-in. We couldn't do that. It was all because of our problems on the technology. Uh, it was pretty tough for the, um, you know, we had the partnership with Vitality, and they were really at the forefront in terms of technology, and they were our partners. And it was so frustrating for them because they were bringing out new technology, but for them being our partners, we weren't always able to integrate with what their needs were. So that was frustrating. But once again, that's just a symptom of the inertia that it set in. Yeah, um, you know, was in common. In the book, you do state that Dave Novick was the driving force behind Kalula, not uh, his son, Gidden Novick. Why do you think Gidden is widely credited with launching Kalula instead of Dave? I really couldn't speak very on, on, on that deal. Uh, do you, what did that make you feel, um, given that that was the perception in the marketplace? Oh, I, I have no feelings on it. Um, I was I was just surprised. But at the time that Gidden started rising up through the ranks, it's it's clear, and you write about in the book that there was almost a breakdown in terms of the communication and trust that um, you had established with Dave. Uh, things would happen around the boardroom table, but then the decision would be taken in the corner office. Yeah, but. Um... Look, at it. I think family-owned businesses are great businesses to work for. It's a strength. I think family-owned businesses generally outperform non-family-owned businesses. So I have no problem working for a family-owned business. I think it's a great strength. What, what the difficulty is when a business moves from private to public, it's, it's probably not that easy then at that point still to manage that it's a family-owned business because once you become, become a public company, um, the structure that work in a private company for a family-owned business, um, I'm not sure it works as well. Mm, yeah. uh, there, well, there are certain governance processes that one has to adhere to, uh, but they can also be used against you, and much like you know, King was used selectively, as you say in the book, uh, towards the back end of your yeah. tenure and that the third stint at Comi. Overall, why do you think businesses... Yeah. And uh, you have, uh, perhaps, also, perhaps also in the book, you know, um, my... The strain in the relationship between myself and Dave Novick was not to do with Gidon at all. It was to do with my foreign currency loss. Uh, I entered into a foreign currency transaction that incurred a loss, and, and that really put the strain on the relationship between uh, myself and the chair. But, the that, and the, but that also related to the Twin Towers um, uh, terrorist attack, didn't it? Which, which was very yes. difficult to foresee yeah. I mean, at the time, uh, but it does show you how, how dangerous hedging yeah. can be. Oh, yeah, no. Um, you know, on hedging, the only one that works for hedging is the banks. The banks make the money on hedging. Um, I've done fuel hedging, I've done currency hedging, and the only ones who make the money is always the banks. And it's the way they do the pricing. They always price out of the market, not at market, and they always apply these volatility factors, which they call, which just prices everything, you know, in, in their favor. So um, I'm really not a fan of hedging. I've, I've not seen it work, um, and... You know, but I suppose at the time, nine eleven was really unusual because it almost like had a triple whammy. Uh, people stopped flying because they were scared to fly. Um, secondly, aircraft values collapsed because if people weren't flying, aircraft values collapsed. And then thirdly, the whole global economy just took a knock. 
So I remember watching that second aircraft hit the tower and not for a second was I realizing, wow, you know, the full repercussions of this aircraft flying to the tower is it's going to wipe out aircraft values, it's going to wipe out air travel, and it's going to wipe out our currency. And, and that triple whammy happened exactly at the wrong time between when we purchased the aircraft and uh, fixed the foreign currency deal and had to pay. It was, it was bad luck, but at the same time, I own that um, I was looking at upside and not properly protecting the downside, which, you know, which I need to own. How would you describe your relationship with the Novix now? Um, I talk about Dave Novick. What uh, what was great is that um, when I was appointed to CEO, um, CEO at Comen, uh, I think it was 2018. I think Dave Novick had left in 2011 when his son left Comen, and I actually got a call from Dave Novick, um, and he thanked. Uh, he said hi to me, and he said he's really happy that I met Comen. He thinks I'm the right person for Comen. Um, and he wishes to congratulate me and wish me luck. So that meant a lot to me because I'd worked with Dave Novick for many years. Obviously, there'd been the fallout when I started one time, uh, and it meant a huge amount that he actually made the call and, um, you know, he, he actually wished me luck and said that it was the right thing to do. So even though he'd left Kami and sold his shares, it was still something close to his heart. Um, so it, it really meant a lot to me, that call. And, and Giddon? Uh, I'll chat to Gidon now and again. Yeah, yeah. He sent me congratulations on the book. So, um, no, I'm fine. Life's too short to have any enemies. I have no enemies. <laughs> not even, uh, not even inside the Department of Public Enterprises. I mean, you did, you did talk about the politics of Mango. I think offering some insights into how or whether SAA can ever be turned around, uh, given how at the time Pravin Gordon seemed to block your appointment as CEO. What were your feelings about this at the time? And what are your fe- your views now on SAA, uh, given the speculation around whether or not this turnaround will actually turn? Yeah, I'm fairly optimistic about SAA. Um, if you look at what they're doing, they're doing all the right things. They've chopped their headcount down dramatically. They've reduced their fleet. Um, and they're trying to grow slowly, you know, sort of one aircraft at a time. Um, they're focusing on the regional and international routes where they have expertise, uh, particularly regional into Africa. Um, I think they will struggle on the trunk routes. You know, they would struggle to London and to Paris and to Berlin because you're up against global distribution systems there. But I think if they stick to cherry picking Africa and, uh, you know, even like South America and some of the islands, I think they will do well. In South Africa, they're only focusing on the trunk routes, so I think they'll do well as well. Um, my sort of sense is that SAA will end up as owning the premium market in South Africa and probably SAFE will end up own, owning um, that the sort of low fare market. So I'm fairly confident that um, it, it will succeed. Is there space for something in between those, uh, those two? I mean, if you were to launch a new domestic airline in South Africa today, and I, I travel quite frequently on that very busy Joburg Cape Town route and it's clear that there is now, post-COVID, um, there isn't a sufficient capacity to meet demand. What would you focus on to make a, a domestic airline in South Africa today successful? Yeah, so since the airlines they have a shortage of capacity right now because the airfares are, are really high, um, so it, no, it, <laughs> it, it suits them right now. So it needs a new entrant. Um, a new entrant would bring down airfares. Um, and achieve some degree of market equilibrium. No problem. Um, do you think? Do you think the the the, the market is attractive enough for um, there to be talk of a new entrant or to um, attract investors? Given um, that it is in favour of the airlines at the moment, but we know how this industry can quickly change. When there's overcapacity, everyone competes on price. And, and sometimes uh, unfairly so, and it becomes a bit of a race to the bottom and to see who can hold the, you know, who can blink first uh, when it comes to pricing in this issue. How do you see it playing out? You know, it always seems to be the cycle, which is why I always talk about the three fundamentals, and they are not unique to um, aviation. You need low costs. Uh, in other words, you have to be really efficient compared to your competitors. You need a uh, 
to build cash, have a business model that generates cash, and avoid excessive debt. So if you have those three elements in your formula, uh, you actually will succeed. Just lastly, Glenn, looking back at your tenure and um, you know what happened with Comair, are there any decisions or actions you would have taken differently personally to alter the course of the company's fate? Yeah, I'm not sure if it would have altered the course. Um, so, you know, I, I just talk about in the book what was the root cause of Comair Spade, and the root cause was when it threw out those three principles. Um, so when I was there in my final stint, we had identified the root cause, the excessive cost, the excessive debt, and the shortage of cash, and started taking steps, <laughs> you know, whereby we brought down the operating costs significantly. You know, we brought the debt down, down from 2,200 to 1,200. We got our break-even load factor from, I think, 86% down to under 70%. So we were on the right track, and I think we would have succeeded. Um, but unfortunately, when we had those external shocks, we were far too weak to absorb those external shocks. So if I look at what I might have done differently, I might have um, been less optimistic on the size of the airline. Perhaps we should have started smaller than what we did. Um, and maybe once we reduce costs, I should be tougher than what I was. Um, so those those are owned, and uh, I'm, I'm fairly frank about them in the book as no, well. No, you, you really are, and I think uh, that that is what is so refreshing about the book, is it's just uh, in your style. It's frank, it's honest, uh, and it's kind of take it on the chin, uh, but this is business. You know, if, if it's too hot in the kitchen, you just shouldn't be in the kitchen at the end of the day. Are you going to get back in the kitchen? Is, you know, is the industry siren song calling to you again it's actually something you talk about you know if uh, if you can't send the heat get out of the kitchen but if tech was happening at comma i almost felt like a uh like fighting a 15 round boxing fight and every round someone knocked us down and we just got up and fought another round we got knocked out we just got up again so we really just kept getting up until that final 15th round you just weren't able to get up again you know, that, that full and final top. Yeah. So um, I'm still involved in the industry um, and uh, I'm young. So <laughs> so let's see. Yeah, uh, apologies for my call. No, no, it's that time of year. Uh, I've just recovered as well. Um, just as a, a final reflection, all of this, I mean, you've distilled in some great lessons in the book, but personally, how has it shaped your approach to to leadership and, and also to crisis management because it's interesting just to see how communication was such an important element when it came to managing what was going on with uh, with Comair as well, particularly amongst you know um, passengers who had paid an air airfare and then you know the, the the business went into business rescue. What has all of this taught you from a leadership perspective? Um, I've never really studied leadership. I've always just tried to take a view I need to be true to my own values and my own way of doing things so as long as I'm true to myself um, you know there, there is no single leadership style that succeeds you know some are autocratic some are participative some are nice some are less nice and yet they seem to succeed um, so simplistically my mind I've just tried to be true to my own values and my way of doing things um, obviously you always need to have empathy but you need to make hard decisions where they need to be made um, you learn all the time. I'm still young. I'm still going to learn a lot more lessons. Hopefully, I have enough time to apply these lessons as well. So uh, from from a leadership point of view, uh, I, I, I just really keep learning um, all the time. But simplistically, just be true to yourself. Mm, mm. Well, that, that comes through for me. It's a, a, One could probably characterize it just as an authentic leadership style, which I think in today's world, uh, is probably the most effective. I think people see very quickly through something that's been overly MBA'd or workshopped or whatever people uh, want to put uh, in terms of a business buzzword on things. And then, you know, authenticity really does come through in uh, Crash and Burn. Glenn Orsman, thank you very much. Founder of One Time, two time CEO of Comair. And uh, now you can also add author to the CV. Uh, grab a copy of Crash and Burn if you love business and a bit of a boardroom backstabbery as well. You've uh, been listening uh, and watching. Business Talk here on Business Tech.